things that run the world. Makes sense. If we don't have them, the world's not gonna not gonna run. So, and in doing that, I also want to talk to you about what I feel is is nature's best hope uh, for the future. Uh, but before I do those things, um, I want to revisit what happened on much of the east east coast last fall uh, from Massachusetts. I don't know if it got all the way down to Florida or not, but uh, west to the Mississippi. It was what we call uh, an, a, an oak mast year. All the red oaks got together and decided they would make their acorns at the same time. And this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, if you're easily entertained like I am, maybe you took one of those acorns and just stared at it. And maybe you saw this little insect start to chew its way out of the acorn and it didn't take long. So it uh, chewed a little hole, then it started to squeeze its way through. It kind of looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy finally plopped down on the ground. Very dangerous time for this insect larva because it is good to eat and lots of things want to eat it. So it does a little bit more squirming and about 30 seconds gets below the ground where it stretches in all different directions, makes a little chamber and then transforms itself into a pupa. And then it stays there for two years. And when it comes out, it's an acorn weevil. This is what an acorn weevil looks like. They have what uh, most people think is a very long nose, but it's actually an extension of the head capsule and the mouth parts are way down here. Uh, and they use those mouth parts to chew a hole down into the center of the acorn. Females turn around, lay an egg in that hole and the larva tunnels down. And that's how the larva gets inside the acorn where it develops very safely. Well, you might wonder why they spend two years underground. Uh, and the answer is that it takes uh, red oaks, red oak acorns, 18 months to complete their development. If they came out the next year, uh, there'd be a much smaller crop of acorns available for them. Well, that of course leaves a hole in the acorn and you all know that nature abhors a vacuum. Uh, well, there are specialized ants in the genus Temnothorax that like to live in the vacated holes made by uh, acorn weevils. So if they discover a brand new acorn with a hole in it, they get excited. They want to move their entire colony into it. Uh, and they do that. It takes about 30 minutes. They grab their larvae, they grab their eggs. Everybody works very hard. They move the queen and then they post a guard here at the, at the entrance to make sure nobody else comes in. And that is their new home for the next two years until this disintegrates itself. Uh, well, about this time, my wife says, what is your point? What are you trying to tell us? What I'm trying to tell you is this is this is one of literally millions of specialized interactions that comprise nature. This is one that happens in, in my yard. If you have oak trees in your yard, it happens in your yard as well. Here's another one, um, the, the very close uh, relationship between jays of all kinds and uh, acorns. They're the primary disperser of acorns. They'll carry them up to two miles away. If you want to have pileated woodpeckers breeding in your in your yard, you need lots of carpenter ants because that's what they rear their young on. And of course, you're not going to have lots of carpenter ants unless you have the large trees to support those carpenter ants. You're not going to have this bee, Andrena, Andrena facilii, unless you have this plant, Facilia. That is the only pollen, the pollen from this plant is the only pollen that bee can rear its young on. As a matter of fact, we have lots of specialized bees out there. There are 13 species of native bees that um, can only rear their young on on the pollen of various species of sunflowers. Baltimore checker spot uh, needs white turtle head. I could go on all night about specialized relationships, but today these types of relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over the edge and said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. The problem, of course, is that today uh, it's impossible to leave most of the country as it was because uh, we haven't. There's only about 5% of the lower 48 states that's any cl anything close to its original pristine state. And that's because we've logged the country repeatedly, we've tilled it, we've drained it. We've grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland in the US. We've of course paved it and otherwise developed it. We have straightened uh, our rivers and dammed them and you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our, our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our, our natural areas. Uh, in short, we have carved up the natural world into tiny remnants of its former self. And each one of those remnants, those fragments are too small and too isolated to sustain the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. 
You might wonder why we've done that. Uh, well, we weren't, we weren't thinking. We thought that our nest, planet Earth, was so large we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. But of course, we were, we were wrong and that's why we're seeing headlines like this. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect declines. Followed by this headline, we've lost 3 billion birds in North America in the last 50 years. That's a third of our North American bird population. The UN now predicts we're going to lose a million species to extinction, possibly in the next 20 years. By the way, um, that's not an option. That is simply not an option. They might as well say uh, we're going to lose oxygen in the next 20, 20 years. It's just simply not an option. So we can't treat it as just another headline. We have to start acting on it. So I can go on uh, about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, and that's upon all of our houses, but that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox, a cure that's going to take uh, small efforts from a lot of people, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return to this headline briefly. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, the great uh, Edward O. Wilson, E.O. Wilson, told us what it meant. He, of course, is the greatest entomologist alive, one of the greatest biologists of all time. Professor Emeritus at, at, at Harvard, I could give an entire talk on his many accomplishments. Uh, but he wrote a paper specifically about what would happen uh, to Earth's ecosystems if uh, invertebrates, and he's largely talking about insects, were to disappear. And he called them the little things that run the world. This was 1987. Uh, very, very uh, briefly, his life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of the flowering plants. About 90% of flowering plants would go extinct, which would not only change the physical structure of, of uh, terrestrial habitats, it would seriously alter energy flow through terrestrial ecosystems. That's the energy that essentially creates the food webs that support our animals. So without that energy, we would lose our animals, our amphibians, our reptiles, our birds and mammals, they would all disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would, would rot as opposed to having the rapid uh, turnover of, of nutrients that uh, insect decomposers provide right now. You'd only have bacteria and, and fungi to do that job. And of course, humans would not survive any of those drastic changes. There is good news here, and that is none of this has to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but in order to do that, we're going to have to dramatically change the way we landscape. Let's talk briefly about why we need to do that. Um, let me remind you, humans are products of nature. We totally depend on, on the, the services provided by, by natural ecosystems. Here are just some of the things that plants give us. They produce oxygen. Obvious, we all need that. They clean our water, slow its journey to the, to the sea where it becomes too salty to use. Carbon capture, this is an enormously important ecosystem service today. Plants pull carbon out of the atmosphere, lock it up in their tissues, and even more important, they pump that carbon into the ground. Their roots deposit carbon in the ground. Our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plants have put there. It's then out of harm's way. It's not altering any climate. They build topsoil and hold it in place. If we didn't have plants, the earth would be one big rock because all the topsoil would be in the ocean. They prevent floods. They dampen severe weather and many other things. What do animals do for plants? Well, they provide pest control services that keep the plants from all being eaten up. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. Uh, they disperse the plant seeds and many other things. So designing landscapes that destroy the production of these ecosystem services is simply not an option. We need them. We need them more than ever now because we've got 7.8 billion people on the planet. This type of landscape doesn't make those services. There were visionaries uh, through the ages that recognized that we humans did not have great relationship with, with planet Earth. Aldo Leopold, Leopold was one of the um, most eloquent in the early part of the 19th century. I mean, the 1900s, he wrote lots of things. One of the things he said was, uh, the oldest task in human history is to live on a piece of land without spoiling it. Now, there have been some indigenous groups that, that uh, have managed to do that for quite some time, but uh, particularly our Western uh, capitalistic society, we're terrible at that. We want to extract as much as we can from the earth, and uh, if we ruin a spot, it doesn't matter, we'll just go ruin some someplace else. 
There are very few someplace else at this point. So Aldo recognized that we needed to develop what he called a land ethic. He recognized that we did have to use the land. We had to farm it and lumber it and graze and mine and hunt on it. But we needed to learn how to do that without destroying local ecosystems. And he wrote about this in Sand County Almanac and called it the land ethic. Uh, I've always wondered why uh, he never talked about developing a land ethic where we actually live, though. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist together in the same place at the same time is so deeply embedded uh, in, in the culture of Aldo's day, and, and it's still embedded in ours, that he didn't even recognize it as an option. Well, today I want to I uh, emphasize that um, living with nature is an option, and I'm, I'm going to suggest it is now the only viable option that's left to us today. So in the past, we had conservationists who worked exclusively where people aren't. We need to turn that on its head. We now need to save nature where people are. So we have to find ways for nature to thrive in our human dominated landscapes. Because let's face it, most of our landscapes are human dominated. Where are we gonna start? Well, one, one uh, of the places we cannot um, ignore is private property. And that's because so much of the U.S. is privately owned. East of the Mississippi, it's 85.6% of the U.S. privately owned. If we ignored those, those private holdings and only did conservation on, on uh, other spaces, we'd be talking about 15% of the land. That's not nearly enough to preserve the amount of, of functional nature that we need. But there are a lot of areas that we, we have not considered to be options for, for conservation centers that could be. How about uh, power and pipeline rights of ways? We've got 21 million acres of, of rights of ways in power and pipelines. We've got railroad rights of ways, another 3 million acres. Golf courses, 2 million acres. Airports, 3 million acres. The Denver airport is twice the size of Manhattan. These are huge places. Then we have all the places where we live in suburbia, exurbia, uh, urban centers, hundreds of millions of acres in those, those places. Roadsides, we have 40 million miles of paved roads. Each one of them has two edges, another 17 million acres. If you just add up these areas and everybody can think of other options, that's 599 million acres. How big is 599 million acres? Well, it's bigger than Vermont plus New Jersey, plus Maine, Virginia, New York, Georgia, Florida, Oklahoma, Montana, plus California, even add Texas in there, still less than 599 million acres. So not having a place to do conservation is not the issue. We've got a lot of places we can do conservation. What are we gonna do on all these lands? We have to restore nature. That doesn't mean we have to build nature exactly the way it was before we came and, and changed it. Um, that's probably going to not be possible, but we can reestablish natural interactions uh, that sustain themselves, and I'll call that nature, even if they're not exactly what was there before. But we have to start with the, the, the species that are the building blocks of nature. Not all species contribute equally to ecosystem function, and some are necessary for others to uh, exist. So let's, let's start with the most important species. The first thing we need to do is create the food webs that support all the other species. So we have to, we have to get that energy from plants. Plants are capturing the energy from the sun, but then we have to transfer it to animals. Most animals don't eat plants directly. They eat something that ate plants, and most of that something is caterpillars. It turns out that caterpillars are transfer more energy from plants to any other uh, to other animals than any other type of plant eater, elephants or anything else. If you took caterpillars out of the system, most of the energy that plants capture would stay locked up in plants uh, and that would be the end of, of the food webs. Here's an example, Carolina chickadee. Uh, a lot of people think of them as seed eaters because they are eating seeds at our feeders right now. But when they're reproducing, they are, babies can't eat seeds. So they, they feed them insects. And most of the insects, insects it turns out, are caterpillars. Uh, and chickadees are not exceptions. Most birds, 96% <laughs> of our terrestrial birds in North America are rearing their young on insects. And it turns out most of those insects are caterpillars. And here's uh, a little data to support that statement. Uh, this is a study that my uh, recent PhD student, Ashley Kennedy, completed. 
she had a citizen science project where she asked people from all over the country to take pictures of birds during the breeding season when they were carrying food to the nest. They sent her pictures, about 7,000 of them. She identified the prey item in the beak, uh, and then she was able to construct these nestling diets. This is for 20 bird families. The green bars represent the percentage of the nestling diet that was caterpillars. And in 16 of the 20 bird families, caterpillars dominate the diet. So imagine what would happen if we took caterpillars out of the, the environment. 16 out of our 20 common bird families would not be able to reproduce successfully. Why caterpillars? What is special about, about caterpillars? There are a lot of other insects out there. Well, it turns out there's a number of things that are special. Um, one of the most obvious is they, they're relatively soft prey items. <coughs> if you think of this caterpillar as a little sausage with a thin wrapper, the thin wrapper is exoskeleton, it's cuticle. Cuticle is not digestible. Birds don't want it because they can't digest it. So caterpillars are perfect. You get, you get this sausage which is stuffed with a lot of protein and fat with very little undigestible parts. And because it's, it's soft, the birds can stuff them down the throat of their offspring without fear of injuring the, the esophagus. And, and uh, you know, parent birds are pretty rough. They use their beak like a plunger and they just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Now some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but you wanna chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar. As I said, they're very nutritious, very high in protein, very high in fat. They have a low percentage of chitin of exoskeleton compared to other insects, particularly beetles, which are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. A uh, lot of undigestible material there. And they also have a lot of sharp edges. And it turns out that caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now I mentioned carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, um, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate and birds are vertebrates and vertebrates cannot make their own carotenoids yet they are essential components of our diets. You have to get carotenoids from plants and that's why my wife Cindy says I have to eat my carrots to get my beta carotene and I have to eat my tomatoes to get my lycopene, my whatever that is to get my lutein and she makes sure uh, I get a healthy diet of carotenoids because they stimulate my immune system and I cannot think of a better time to have uh, a very strong immune system. They're also antioxidants. They run around our body and protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better. She was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. They improve sperm vitality. They improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about largely about uh, male birds here, like this prothonotary warbler. He is bright yellow because he's had access to lots of lutines. And he makes pigments out of those lutines, puts them in his feathers. And the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. So birds are getting their carotenoids from the prey items that they're bringing back to the nest, but um, carotenoids are not distributed equally in those prey items. Uh, the first two bars here represent two types of, of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of, of invertebrates. The third bar is orthopteroids, things like uh, uh, grasshoppers and crickets and katydids. Here's adult caterpillars down here, the moths and the butterflies. They don't have a lot of carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. It's the caterpillars that are eating the green leaves where the carotenoids are. And here's the earthworm way down here. The early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. Does this make a difference when birds are out foraging? Are they picking prey items based on carotenoid content? Well, uh, we do believe that that's one of the criteria, and this comes from uh, another study done by Ashley. Uh, she had GoPro cameras that she put on the top of bluebird boxes, and those cameras took a picture once every second. So when the bluebirds came in with a prey item, they often sat on the roof of the, of the house. The GoPro camera took their picture, and Ashley was able to um, identify what the prey item was. Well, she had a lot of bluebird boxes and a lot of GoPro cameras, and she did it for three years, so she had more than a million pictures to go through. Uh, but after she did, she found a very nice relationship between the frequency with which a prey item was brought to the nest, and that was caterpillars brought the most, and the amount of carotenoids they had, followed by those orthopteroids, and then everybody else with not much carotenoid was, was uh, nestled down here in the corner. So all this suggests that um, caterpillars may not be optional parts of bird diets. It's, it's starting to look like they are essential parts of bird diets. 
So we know birds need caterpillars. How many do they need? Is one or two enough? Uh, so that's the question. Let's go back to chickadees. There's a lot of data on chickadees. Uh, no, one or two is not enough. It takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars just to bring chickadees to the point where they, they leave the nest, where they fledge. Um, but then they continue to, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 24 days before those birds become independent. Thousands and thousands of caterpillars. And keep in mind, chickadees and most birds are not foraging very far from the nest. For chickadees, it's about 50 meters from the nest. So if you want chickadees breeding in your yard, you gotta have thousands and thousands of caterpillars produced in your yard. The bird is not gonna fly down the road to the nearest woodlot. That's, that's too much energy to get, get the, uh, the food to return. When we landscape in ways that do not make enough caterpillars or other insects, um, there's an uh, increasing amount of evidence that suggests that is one of the factors causing bird declines. Let's go back to this study by Rosenberg et al, 2019, that says we've lost 3 billion birds. Well, they, they published the, their raw data and we took a look at it and saw that the, the birds that are losing um, numbers, losing population size, it's not distributed equally across all types of birds. We separated birds into two different types, the ones for which insects are essential, at least at one part of their life history, typically when they're breeding, and ones that do not need insects at any part of their, their life history. Uh, and that's primarily the finches and the doves and the other birds that can rear their young uh, only on seeds. Well, they actually gained some, some uh, millions in, in population size over the past 50 years. But the insects that depended on birds lost on average about 10 million individuals per species. This all means we need to landscape for caterpillars, folks. If we want to have birds, we've got to, got to put those caterpillars back into the landscape. How do we do that? Well, we add caterpillars by adding the plants that make them. That makes sense. But there is a catch, and that is all plants don't make caterpillars uh, equally. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of plants that don't make hardly any caterpillars. And that's because caterpillars are really fussy about what they eat, at least most of them are. And the monarch butterfly, of course, and this is a monarch caterpillar, illustrates that really well. If you want to have monarch caterpillars, having crepe myrtles or, or having uh, uh, Brazilian pepper trees or, or any of the the South American or, or Asian ornamentals that we typically landscape with, camellias, none of those are gonna produce monarchs. The only thing that's gonna make monarchs are milkweeds, plants in the milkweed lineage. That's called host plant specialization. And 90% of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Why? Because plants don't wanna be eaten. They wanna capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they loaded their tissues with nasty tasting chemicals secondary metabolic compounds that make those, those uh, leaves in particular either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a very effective defense that keeps most of the, the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green outside. It's not because there's no insects out there that wanna eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected chemically. And if you don't believe me after this talk, go outside and eat a plant, see if you like it. You're not gonna like it. Every plant is protecting itself uh, chemically, except our agricultural plants where we have bred out those, those nasties. There is a reason it's hard to get our kids to eat vegetables. It's because they inherently know that they're toxic. Yes, that's a joke. But this is not a joke. Insects do eat plants. How do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. And as I said, 90% of those insects that eat plants um, can only eat the lineage of plant for which they have developed specialized adaptations. They develop enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those plants. They develop behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize their exposure to those nasty chemicals. All those adaptations take a long period of, of interaction with that particular plant lineage. They do not pop up overnight. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. When we're trying to reestablish natural interactions in the landscapes where we dominate, the plants we put in those landscapes are gonna determine whether or not we succeed. And I'm gonna give you three examples of where it has worked. And I'm gonna start with, with our house in Oxford, Pennsylvania. We have 10 acres. This is what it looked like when we moved in. I am now sitting in this window right here. 
Um, and the area had, had been farmed for 300 years before we moved in, but the latest type of farming was uh, simply mowing for hay. Uh, and they were pretty sloppy about it. And they, they actually stopped mowing three years before we moved in. And what came up, of course, were the invasive plants that have escaped from our gardens and now cover the area. This is my wife, Cindy, getting ready to remove them from our 10 acres. You're looking at multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and autumn olive and, and uh, privet and calorie pear and Norway maple. Ah, they're all there. And you might say, well, there's no way she can do that from 10 acres. She did do it from 10 acres. You just start at the corner and you just keep pushing, pushing them back. It is a lot of work, but um, one person can do it. What did I do in the meantime? Well, I told her she was doing a very good job, uh, but I was also putting plants back. Uh, and I, I chose the plants. My little hobby is to take pictures of, of caterpillars that I think are pretty. So I was putting the plants that would bring those caterpillars to our yard. Now they should have been there anyway, but uh, these are the ones I, I started with. I wanted the Canadian outlet to come so I could take that, that pretty picture. But to have Canadian outlets, and that's what the adult looks like, it's just like a leaf. You have to have meadow rue. We didn't have any meadow rue. I don't know of any meadow rue around here. So I had to get some seeds from someplace else and I, I planted meadow rue. I didn't know how many years it would take for Canadian outlets to find the meadow rue. Um, so I kind of ignored it. Uh, I saw that it germinated and then I didn't even look at it for a month or two. And when I finally did go out and look at it, it was just about defoliated because the Canadian outlets had found it right away. So that was a, a speedy success. And now we have a thriving population of meadow rue and Canadian outlets, and that's how it works. I wanted the goldenrod stowaway, this this beautiful uh, yellow orange moth. <clears throat> that's a misnomer, by the way. It has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's aristosa. Some people call it ditch daisy. We didn't have any ditch daisy, so I got some seeds from a power line cut uh, about 15 miles away. Planted them. Uh, it took the moth over a year to find my Biden's aristosa, but they did. Now I've got a thriving population of both. Wanted Hackberry Emperor because it's a butterfly that ought to be on our property. But it's the Hackberry Emperor, which means it needs Hackberry. We didn't have any Hackberries. I planted some Hackberry. I went out this June, looked at one of the Hackberry branches. It had nine Hackberry Emperor caterpillars on, on a single branch. Uh, but it took, I don't know, three or four years for the butterflies to, to find it. I did not plant goldenrod, came in on its own, and along with it came uh, the, the insects that use goldenrod. Let's just focus on the caterpillars, like the brown hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparagonothus, the goldenrod gall moth. Now this is what I'm waiting for, the goldenrod flower moth. We've been here, this is our 20th year, and this guy still has not found our, our goldenrod. So this is, this is anticipation. It's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Uh, that's what the larvae look like. Every year I go out and look for the goldenrod flower moth. And one of these years, I'm gonna find it and that'll be a great day. Same thing, Virginia creeper. I planted it so it would bring the particular caterpillars I wanted to photograph to our yard. Pandora sphinx happened right away, came within the first year, got pictures of its beautiful adult. But then other things that I didn't, I wasn't focusing on uh, came in because they eat uh, Virginia creeper as well. Like the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx. I waited a long time for them, but finally came this year and many others. Wanted zebra swallowtail because I think it's the prettiest of our swallowtails, but it is a specialist on pawpaws. Uh, well, the nearest population of zebra swallowtails that I know about is 26 miles away. And again, I did not know how long it would take them to find uh, our pawpaws. It took them nine years. So we did have to be a little patient with that one. They finally found it. But in the meantime, I got the pawpaw sphinx. Didn't know there was a pawpaw sphinx until, until it showed up. And of course, we got lots of pawpaws. We wanted the double tooth prominence. So we planted uh, elm, we planted American elm and got it right away. The evening primrose moth. Uh, so we planted evening primrose and this is what it does during the day, it comes and hides in the flowers. And of course we planted oaks. Now these are, this is just an example of the plants we put in our yard. But um, you know, a lot of, this is the Bedford oak in Bedford, New York. And people argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. Uh, and a lot of people think you need an enormous oak like this before it starts to contribute to your landscapes. Not so. Most of the oaks I put in our yard, I planted as acorns, which means they were free by the way, or as uh, bare root whips, which meant they cost about a dollar. 
So they were tiny plants and right away the things that oak support started coming to our, our property like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, the orange headed epicolema, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streaked dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, uh, the crown bucolatrix, the white blotch heterocampa, the red line, nope, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laffer, and literally hundreds more caterpillars have come to the oaks that we put in our property. And they came right away. Here's a pin oak that has just popped up uh, above the, the, uh, the, the ground first year. And here's a crocus geometer standing on the ground eating it right away. So you don't have to wait hundreds of years before your oaks start to contribute. They contribute immediately. This is a picture of our house from the same perspective that I took that first picture. Um, look, we have lawn. We're very traditional here. But it represents uh, what we've done. We put a lot of plants back and so many moths came to our house that I made it a goal to take a picture of every single species that I could find. I've been doing it for about four years now uh, and I am not not finished, but I am up to 1,012 species of moths so far. That's just moths. We haven't gotten to the butterflies yet. That's 1,012 species of, of bird food that have come to our yard because we put the plants back. And because we have so much bird food, we have recorded 55 species of birds breeding on our 10 acres. You know, I saw this, this headline uh, beginning of last week, I guess it was. World Wildlife Fund says two thirds of wildlife have vanished since 1970. Not at our house. As a matter of fact, I'm going to wager we have increased wildlife at our house by, by two thirds, which is the point. You can put it back. You can put it back. But I know what you're thinking. You don't own 10 acres, so it's not going to work unless you have a property that, that big. Well, it's a good question. Will it work in a typical suburban yard? Let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. This is a typical suburban uh, lot. It's 0.6 acres, less than one acre. It is surrounded by, by typical suburban yards with giant lawns and very few trees. The, the uh, big invasive plant in Kirkwood, Missouri is bush honeysuckle. So the first thing Margie and Dan did was take out the bush honeysuckle. They planted a lot of native plants and they also installed, excuse me, what they call a bubbler. It's just a water feature. And then they started to count the birds that came to use their yard. And they're up to 149 species, 35 warbler species. Just to put that into perspective, um, we at our house have only recorded eight warbler species. We got 10 acres, they've got less than one acre. So it works, it works. But will it work in an urban yard? Let's go to Pam Carlson's yard. Pam lives in Chicago where she has one tenth of an acre that is three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. And when I say in Chicago, I mean in Chicago. She is right next to one of the runways of O'Hare Airport. She is right next to Kennedy Expressway. There is absolutely no connectivity between her yard and any natural area. She is an island. Well, she, she took out her invasive plants, put in 60 species of native plants, a water feature for the birds. And then she sat back and started counting those birds uh, just like the, the terpster. She's up to 116 species on her 10th of an acre, including a woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to uh, Pam's house in Chicago and you can check it out. But what about inner city centers? You know, 82% of, of uh, North American uh, population now lives in cities. Are they gonna be left out? Well, I, I uh, was looking at this plant, Asclepius tuberosa, butterfly weed, back in 2014. And butterfly weed reminds me, we have a serious marketing issue with our native plants. We call them weeds and then wonder why people don't plant them. So we're not gonna call this butterfly weed. We're gonna call it Monarch's Delight. Okay, I was staring at Monarch's Delight in 2014 and the first thing I saw was this megachylid bee, this leafcutter bee. Uh, and I know it's a leafcutter bee because it collects its pollen on its tummy, not on its, its legs. This is a species I hadn't seen in quite some time. So that was, that was neat. It's always good to see a new insect. Um, well, leafcutter bees have very specific requirements. Not only do they need pollen and nectar, they need soft leaves very close by because they cut the edges out of those leaves, roll them up, uh, make a little tube and then stuff that tube with pollen. 
And that is where they lay their eggs and they stuff that, that whole tube into a crack or a, a crevice. Well, there was red bud as soft leaves right next to the, the monarch's delight. So the leafcutter bees had everything they needed. And because there was red bud there, there were also bumblebees there. Uh, remember, queen bumblebees do all the foraging in the spring because they haven't made any workers yet. So they need a lot of spring forage to do that successfully. And because red bud's a great early season uh, bloomer, they had what they needed to get that colony going and there were bumblebees there. And then I saw a monarch. As a matter of fact, I saw two monarchs. Now this was 2014. I had gone all of 2013 without seeing a single monarch. 2013 was the low point in the uh, monarch population for the eastern, uh, east of the Rockies population. Only about 3.6% of them left. Uh, and this was June. It's unusual for us to, to see monarchs uh, this far up the east coast in June. So I was very excited. I mean, that was in, encouraging to me. Why were they there? Well, they had monarchs delight. They also had other species of milkweed. Uh, so they had forage and they also had the necessary host plant. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line in the middle of Manhattan. The High Line is a converted, if you haven't been there, it's a converted uh, uh, railroad, a restored elevated railroad that had been abandoned. And this is the amount of nature we're talking about. We're talking about a strip of plants uh, that are largely native, but not entirely native. And they're surrounded by Manhattan. Heavy construction, it's 30 feet above the, the busy uh, street below. Millions of, of people, literally, it's a top tourist destination now because this is their exposure to nature and they love it. Um, and I was convinced, this is, this is Rick Dark. He, he dragged me to the High Line. He said, you've got to see this. And I'm thinking, oh boy, I'm going to see pretty plants and nothing else, but I was totally wrong. Uh, and that impressed me because if, if thoughtful native plantings can bring life to the middle of Manhattan, which, which I'm not much of a city guy. It's, I think it's one of the most inhospitable places on the planet. Um, well, these things didn't think so. If, if you can bring life to Manhattan, you can do it anywhere with the appropriate, appropriate plants. Okay, four keys to success. Uh, if we're going to do this right, there's, there are four things we need to think about. And the first one is we need to shrink the area we have in lawn, lawn in, in, in North America. We've got over 40 million acres of lawn. That, that statistic is almost 15 years old at this point now, so we know it's a lot more than that. Well, that's more than the area of, of um, all of New England. And it looks like this. It's a deadscape. So we have it because it's a status symbol. We love our status symbols. But um, what if we cut this area in half? We could still maintain uh, um, you know, a highly manicured lawn. We could still have our status symbol, but we have less of it. And, and, and the other half would be well planted. If we replanted half that area in lawn, we would have 20 million acres to work with. And if we did that at home, we could call this homegrown national park, create a new national park which would be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, plus Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus Great Smoky Mountains. You add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. And there are, there are real benefits to putting nature back where we, where we live. One of the biggest ones is we will get to develop a personal relationship, possibly for the first time, or if you haven't, haven't uh, um, spent any time in nature lately, you can reacquaint yourself um, right, right where you live. You can do it at your own time and at your own pace. You can do it avoiding crowds. It's free. It's never closed. No matter how many pandemics come down the road, you can always go out in your yard no travel hassles. You can experience the natural world alone, which I think is essential for developing that personal relationship, developing some kind of caring relationship with the natural world. We worry about our kids today who are the future stewards of the planet, by the way. They have nature deficit disorder. According to Richard Liu, they have no exposure to the natural world. So what do we do? We put them on a bus. 30 kids on a bus with a teacher, we go to some natural place, uh, they get out and walk around for an hour and the teacher tells them not to touch anything, they get back on the bus and go home and that is their exposure to the natural world. I'm sure it's better than nothing, but um, what they really had is, is exposure to 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to, not to touch anything. What they need is to experience nature alone, 
no parents hovering over them. They get to discover the natural world alone. That means they might get to hunt lizards. And I'm learning this from my, my own granddaughter. This is Zoe, who lives in Hawaii. And her patch of nature is about 10 by 10 feet. It's grass and a hedge. Yet she has made up this game um, and she's very serious about it. She sent me this slide. This is how you hunt lizards. And, and in Hawaii, those are little, little anoles. You disguise yourself with leaves and sticks and you crawl very slowly on the ground. You can wear your best dress, it's okay, but you sneak up on, on the lizards and that's how you, you hunt them. Uh, this was, uh, I think it was two years ago. I don't know if she's still hunting lizards. I bet she is, but I'll bet she will remember this experience with the natural world the rest of her, her life. If you want to do more than hunt lizards, get this, get this book, Nature Play at Home by Nancy Stranisti. Uh, it's filled with lots of creative things that uh, kids can do in very small places. All right, we're gonna shrink the lawn. The plants we're gonna put in the area we take out of lawn, uh, at least some of them have to be what I call keystone plants. What's a keystone plant? Well, we've discovered that um, not all native plants are producing wildlife benefits uh, in the same way. As a matter of fact, there's a few powerhouses that are doing most of the work. About 5% of our, our native plants are making about 75% of the caterpillar food that is driving the food webs we've been talking about. So that means the question is no longer simply are natives better than, than non-natives. On average, they certainly are. But I could build an all native garden that supports almost nothing because there are natives that don't support a whole lot which means we have to use the right natives. This is the question. Do we want ecologically productive plants in our yards or ecologically benign plants or even worse, ecologically destructive plants? That's what we have to decide. I get an email a couple times a year from somebody reminding me, don't I know that, that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba from, from Asia, actually grew in North America 7 million years ago. So these people argue that makes them native uh, and that means they could plant them and everything will be, be great. This is not the metric. It's not whether they're native or not. It's whether they're productive or not. I don't care if ginkgos grew in the moon 7 million years ago, they produce zero species of caterpillars. That's what they look like. Nothing's eating a ginkgo. It's taking up space. And you can think of any number of, of non-native plants that do the, do the same thing. So productivity is, is the key. And compare that to, to oaks. In 84% of the counties around the country, oaks are the number one keystone genus. Uh, in the mid-Atlantic states where I live, they support 557 species of, of caterpillars. In the entire uh, US, it's over 900 species, hundreds of species in, in Florida. Uh, nothing, no other plant uh, genus comes close to that level of productivity. Let me go over what the power of keystone oaks in my yard means for the diversity in my yard. And we've recorded uh, 1,012 moss species, as I said. And, and remember, I'm not, I'm not finished. I'm running out of uh, warm weather here. But every time I go out and, and collect, I get new species. But 1,012 moss species, out of that 1,012 species, 888 have known host plants. We know what the larvae eat. Of the 888 species that we know what they eat, 262 species use oaks. And we have 59 genera of native plants on our property, only one of which is the oaks, Quercus. And we have hundreds of genera of herbaceous plants. So that means oaks represent less than 2% of our woody plant diversity and way less than 1% of the total plant diversity on our property. Yet they're supporting almost 30%, 29% of the, the moss species diversity. So if we took oaks out of our landscape, uh, think, of, think of what we'd lose. Think of all the bird food that we would, we would lose. That's the power of keystone species. Where do you find out what the keystone species are for your, uh, your neighborhood, your county? Uh, well, there are two sources. We can start with Audubon's Plants for Birds. Uh, there's the website, or you can go to National Wildlife uh, Federation Native Plant Finder. Um, and, and put in your zip code and the ranked list of uh, plants ranked based on the number of caterpillar species that they, they support will pop up for your county. Uh, so here's a typical list. This is, uh, would be a, a, a typical list for most of Florida, believe it or not. Um, 
and it's very similar to a list that, that you see in many parts of the country. Oaks, number one, followed by native uh, cherries, followed by willows, hickories, poplars, maples, even blueberries are way up there. Notice I say native oaks, native cherries, native willows. You can go to the nursery and you can buy non-native oaks. You can get an English oak, you can get a Chinese oak. I have no idea why you would do that. We have 90 species of oaks in this country. Why do you need one from some other place? You can get a, an Asian cherry. You can get weeping willow, which is from uh, the Middle East. But when you substitute these non-native members of our native genera, you're reducing caterpillar use by 68%. We've done that experiment. Here are the top producing um, herbaceous plants, goldenrods always way up there, asters way up there, native sunflowers genus helianthus way up there. And these are also the top producing plants for specialized bees. You know, we have 4,000 species of native bees in the US and we're learning that uh, at least half of them, 2,000 species are highly specialized. They can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plants. These three genera, Solidago, Asters, and, and uh, Helianthus, support uh, dozens of species of specialized bees. If you don't have those genera in your, your landscape, there are dozens of species of, of native bees that can't be there either. All right, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to use keystone plants. And when we use keystone plants, it's going to bring those moths in, and then we're going to kill them with our lights. It turns out that light pollution is one of the major drivers of insect declines. Uh, you know, after a hundred years of studying uh, insects, we still don't know why they, they go to lights, but they do, particularly moths, particularly the moths that make the caterpillars that drive our food webs. Uh, and they die of exhaustion or collisions with the, the light. You know, they're flying around the light till they just, just poop out, or they get incinerated by the light, or they're dehydrated by, by all that flying. The bat comes and picks them off. It blinds a lot of these insects, and it wrecks up their, their daily, uh, um, the things they have to do each, each day. So uh, a lot of research, particularly in Europe, is showing that light pollution around the world, um, and most of it's been done in, in the, the temperate zone, is one of the major drivers of, of insect declines. And this is actually good news to me, because this is the easiest thing to turn around. How do we do that? You turn off your light pretty easy. But I know what you're going to say. Oh, I can't turn off my light because the bad man will come. Okay, put a motion sensor on your nightlight so that it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to discover is that the bad man doesn't come very often. But if you don't want to do that, take out the white bulb that's in your security light and put in a yellow bulb. Yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to, to insects at night than our white wavelengths. And the least attractive are yellow LED lights. If we switch to yellow LED lights, we could save billions of insects overnight, and we'd also save a lot of energy. Okay, we also have to landscape in a way that allows the caterpillars our plants are going to bring to our property to complete their development. What do I mean by that? I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where we have 511 species of, of caterpillars that develop on oaks. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their life cycle on the tree. They eat the leaves, then they spin a cocoon and hang from a branch, then the adult emerges and they do it all over again. And I wish everything did that, but most species don't. About 480 of them, 94%, drop from the tree and wiggle their way under, under the soil where they pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter under the tree. And the problem is we don't have any leaf litter under the, under the trees and the ground is typically so compacted because of all of our mowing and trampling uh, that the caterpillars cannot get underground to, to safety. So this becomes an ecological trap. The, the adult moths come in, lay their eggs, the caterpillars develop, drop to the ground and die. And the next generation, there's far fewer of them. This is another reason we've got global insect decline. We are simply not allowing these, these insects to complete their development. And the, the uh, cement landscape is even less uh, attractive to, to moths, less viable, I should say. I'm not trying to discourage the use of trees in, in cities. I am trying to discourage the profligate use of, of cement as a landscape tool. I mean, that's just laziness and it ruins our, our watersheds. This is what most people do. They have a big lawn, they stick a tree in the middle of it. Nobody has measured how well the caterpillars complete their development in a situation like this, but I can guarantee they do better in a situation like this, where you have a tree, then you have a layered landscape. You have your native azaleas here, your ferns, your ground cover. You could have, have a, a, uh, 
understory tree uh, here, maybe a celtis or a, a, uh, a dogwood. The caterpillars drop out of the canopy and this is a safe site. They can easily get below the surface here because the soil is loose. They can pupate. Nobody's going to squish them. Nobody's going to mow them. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening. Uh, and again, it's a safe site or put in your ground covers. Appropriate ground covers for Florida would be great. Like uh, uh, wild ginger is good for us. May apples, foam flowers. There's lots of, of options. Um, another thing we discovered is that there is room for compromise here, and this is good news to me. And this comes from from uh, my uh, another PhD student who's who's uh, graduated at this point, Desiree Narango, and she looked at uh, chickadee population dynamics within suburban Washington D.C. Uh, she went to typical suburban yards inside the Beltway. Some of those yards had uh, more natives than non-natives. None of them were totally native uh, landscapes. And she compared chickadee uh, reproduction in those landscapes with landscapes that were dominated by introduced ornamentals. When they were dominated by introduced or ornamentals, they produced 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, there was 75% less bird food for those chickadees. Uh, those landscapes were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. Now, Desiree put uh, nest boxes up in every single every single landscape. So the the nest box option was there, but the chickadees would come and they'd look around and they said, there's not enough food here. We're not even going to try. If they did build a nest, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to make it to, to fledging. They simply all died. The nests that did produce fledglings produced 1.2 fewer fledglings and they matured uh, 1.5 days slower. And you might say, well, those aren't huge differences, but if you put all that together in a population growth model as a function of the percentage of non-native plant biomass in the landscape, from no non-natives to 100% non-native, this is what you get. This dotted, dotted line is replacement rate. This is the rate at which the population has to make babies to replace the adults that die that year. If they make as many babies as adults that died, that's a, a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking. If you make more babies than adults that die, you've got a growing population, but if you make fewer, you've got a shrinking population. So you can see as you increase the percentage of non-native plants in the landscape, you, you rapidly switch to an unsustainable population. This is where those lines overlap, right around 30% non-natives. So when you exceed 30% non-native plant biomass, uh, you're, you're in the unsustainable zone. And, um, and I'm afraid that's what's happening to an awful lot of the, the birds that we have out, out there. But here's, this is what I'm excited about. First of all, this is the first time this has been measured for any bird anywhere. So people who doubt that their plant choice actually impacts the things that, that need to be living in our landscapes ought to check this, this study out. Uh, but this zone here, this 30% non-native uh, zone that still allows uh, effective re uh, bird reproduction is the area of compromise. You can have your, your camellia, you can have your ginkgo or whatever other non-native plant you have, as long as it's not invasive. We're not going to allow invasives. Um, and still have viable bird, bird populations as long as the non-native plant biomass is less than, than uh, 30%. And that's good because if, if my message was you can't have any non-native plants in your landscapes, nobody would, would listen. We love our beautiful non-native plants. We just have to temper the amount that we have. Can uh, native plantings be used in formal designings? Of course they can. I got this, this picture uh, uh, this spring on email and I, I did not do a good job of remembering who sent it to me, so I don't know. But it's the land manager of, of this garden. And what he's doing is sneaking in native plants. Here's Joe Pye. I'm not going to call it Joe Pye weed. Uh, and his goal is to replace all of these plantings with native plants and see if anybody notices. Of course, we can have natives in informal designs. Formality is not a function of the plants in the design. It's a function of the design itself. Our native plants are used in formal gardens in Europe all the time. I guess that's okay, though, because they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a, a pollinator garden into a typical suburban yard like this? Of course we can, just put a little fence around it. 
that seems to make it okay. You've got a lot of different plants in here that's going to service a, a number of different types of bees. And if this was a standard feature in every single yard, we'd be able to support viable populations of these native bees. This is a larger option here. These are Drew Latham uh, um, designs, by the way. Imagine the number of things living here versus the number of things living here. Pretty easy to imagine. This is Heather Holmes' uh, yard, part of her yard. Uh, if you don't know Heather, she uh, lives in Minnesota, I guess, and she writes books about native bees. Well, here's what it looked like when she moved into her property, and this is what it looked like after she she uh, fixed it up. She got rid of the hardscape, got rid of the lawn, put in native plantings, and she certainly has a lot more bees now. So it can be done. Can municipalities encourage us? Can they help us live with, with nature? Yes, they can. Minnesota has a cost sharing program that encourages homeowners to replace uh, some or all of their lawn with appropriate prairie plantings and they help them pay for it. You know, that makes it culturally okay because I'm doing what the state wants me to do when your neighbor complains. Uh, you probably heard about this, this program in, in Southern Florida where um, there's uh, at least one island uh, in Florida that's playing, paying its residents to allow burrowing owls, listed species, to burrow into their front yards. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written. It should have been written with carrots rather than sticks. Rather than punishing you or telling you you can't use your property because you've got an invasive species on, or an endangered species on it, they should pay you. Everybody would want an endangered species on their property. Missouri had a, a uh, bounty on cattle repairs. If you brought in a cattle repair body, you got a free tree replacement. And of course, we've got the lawn replacement programs, $2 per square foot rebate in California and some other places by getting rid of those thirsty lawns where they don't have enough water to support them and putting in appropriate xeric plantings. I think we made three missteps in the early years of conservation. And by early years, I, I mean last century. The first is, is we've assumed that nature is important. And we like it but it's not essential, which means when push comes to shove, nature always loses. I was in the Cincinnati Zoo uh, before, before the virus broke out and there was this wall-sized poster, which I think summarizes our entire culture's attitude towards, towards nature. I hear this repeatedly every place I go. We need to save wildlife so future generations can enjoy it, which suggests to me that nature is just there for entertainment and that makes it non-essential. Non um, I, nature's far more than entertainment. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. We're not going to have people on this planet unless we have functioning natural ecosystems. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. That's not going to work. We're everywhere. So either nature disappears or humans disappear. Neither one of those are good options. If we restrict conservation efforts just to untouched areas where there are no humans, we've condemned them to failure because they will be too small and too isolated from each other to sustain the species we need. David Quammen has an excellent analogy between a Persian rug uh, and a functional ecosystem. This is a Persian rug. This is not 71 Persian rugs. It's 71 rug fragments, none of which are functioning as a Persian rug. And this is what we've done to our ecosystems. And we've, we've stuck in between those fragments, we've stuck no man's land where nothing can, can do well. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that terminology because it suggests they're places on planet Earth that have no ecological significance. There's certainly places where we've destroyed the ecological significance, but we got to put it back. And that includes places like our, our yards. Every square inch of the Earth is now needed to produce the ecosystem services that we all need. So what we have to do is put the plants back in those no man areas. We've got to glue our rug back together again. We've got to create ecosystems that are stitched together using those keystone plants and a diversity of other plants, not just to make biological carters so things can move back and forth between viable habitats, but to produce viable habitats in between them. That means we're going to share our spaces with nature. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists. We didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of every single human being. I don't know why, because every single human being depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. That means in my mind that, that every single person bears, bears the responsibility for good Earth stewardship. Stan Rushworth, a Cher Cherokee elder, once said, the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. 
the mindset of indigenous people is I have obligations. And you know, you're not born with these, these mindsets, you're taught them. We need to teach this. We all have obligations to keep this earth spinning. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And I like this approach because it empowers each one of us. So many of us feel totally powerless in today. We've got these giant problems and we feel like one person can't do anything. Uh, but with this, this particular issue, that is simply not true. You can go out in your yard, you can plant that live oak, you can plant any of the other important plants that you have down there in Florida. And the next day you can see the results, you can see the things that come and use that. You can, you can feel that the, the ability of one person to stitch together your, your ecosystems. It makes single people very powerful parts of the, the greater conservation picture. It also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. Just worry about your little piece of the world. Whether you own a piece of land or whether you're volunteering to help fix a local park or, or preserve. Focus on the things we've talked about tonight. We're gonna to shrink the lawn. We're gonna put in a pollinator garden. We're gonna use keystone plants. What else did we talk about? Those three things are, are good. Um, and if you do that, remember 85% of the, of the East is privately owned. We've, we're, we'll be 85% done. So as property owners or as, or as volunteers who don't own property, each one of us has the power. We certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we, need, we do so or decide to do so is gonna determine nature's fate and ultimately it will determine our own fate in the future. Now I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope and I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. Okay. Well, we had a little misstart at the beginning, but I think we're getting there. Um, I can start this part too. First, I need to give you my email. I'm going to go to this thing called the chat. You should have that section in your, um, along somewhere in, around your screen. And I'm going to type in my email address that is related to uh, the Marion Big Scrub. Um, and it's at um, fnps.org. Yeah. Okay. So what I'm going to do is post this. And that is the email that you need to send your name, your email, and give me a little picture of what kind of plants you can use in your yard. Can it be, do you have a lot of grass and maybe we could put some interesting shrubs that can be easily kept tame around the bottom of your trees so that you provide the habitat for those plants and um, caterpillars that are trying to live in your yard and improve that. I think putting shrubs under trees makes it, is one of the easiest things to do to keep the to improve your yard in terms of habitat and if you'll tell me if it's a if you have uh, only palm trees or if you have if you happen to have an oak if you know if it's a live oak or a water oak or a laurel oak it might help me just a little bit to to get the right plants underneath um, you guys can pop open one at a time after you send those emails. Oh, did it only go to Lisa? Oh, okay, I see everyone. Let me do it again.
Did it go to everyone this time? Oh, I might have fixed it originally. Okay, so has everybody got this now? And I'm going to check my email right now. And as soon as we get that part of this program going, you can begin to ask me questions. So once you send your email, you can check in. I was in earlier this morning, so it should open up pretty fast. Okay, well, they should start coming in. All right, so do you have questions about the presentation while everybody else is getting going on that? If you've got the yes there, I'm going to assume that you sent me an email. I hope to start seeing them popping on my computer, but my computer is not fast, even though I'm on a real high level internet here, it's still not very fast. Questions? There's Carol. Carol, can I can I field a question for you? Oh, good. This Saturday, eight to twelve at the livestock site. Um, you want to be thoughtful about what plants you get so that you are providing food every day for your butterfly, moths, insects, birds. So you need to think about, you know, making sure that you've got a continuous banquet in your yard when you're grabbing them. Um, Marion, Master Gardeners are still selling crepe myrtles, which serve no value in the yard. Um, they call them Florida friendly, but they're not, they're not friendly to our birds and our, and our insects. So if you want to get birds into your, into your yard, you're going to have to do what it is that, that Doug has done. I actually have a butterfly list of the butterflies that have been found in, in Marion County and in this area. Uh, for the last four years and was just going through and looking at who likes the oaks. It doesn't say which oak. Um, I'm pretty sure that some of them are live oaks. Uh, the live oak has a little bit less bitter leaf, but it's a tougher oak than the water oaks. Um, I do want to caution you about water oaks and laurel oaks that they are uh, way at the top of the list of the NOS, uh, the least favorable tree to have in your yard during storms. I happen to live in an area where the major tree is a laurel oak and every storm takes our electricity off for anywhere from a half of an hour to 10 hours. Pretty much every storm that has come through, we have been without electricity because the laurel oaks are 50 years old and they drop onto all of our lines. So I can't recommend that one. So if anybody wants one of those trees, you're gonna to have to go get it yourself. I won't get you one. <laughs> yes. I've got a question for you. Yes. Diane. Hi, Diane. Can you give us a list of keystone species for North Central Florida. I was just looking at what they may be. I can tell you two of them right now. The Corcus is one of them. Um, and for us, it turns out that the saw palmetto, the, um, um, the, oh, I don't remember its name right now, but the saw palmetto is one of our keystone um, plants. If you 
need to have it smaller. There's a the silver one. I don't know how it compares to the to the big one. They still don't get really tall. They stop out at about eight to ten foot, maybe a little bit under that. They are very slow growing. So you know it'll take um, those ones that you see in the in the lines of the of the power plants. Those things are a hundred years old. The the amount of time it takes to get to that size is 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 longer than most of us will be working with our yards. But you can get some that stay small if you have to try to replace liriopes or something like that. We can, I, I believe that would be a, an acceptable replacement that is a keystone. I will work on the other keystones for our area. I know Juliet was working on that one. Um, I'm looking at some of the oaks. If it's being eaten, it's being used. There's your clue. Um, so we're just gonna have to go that way. I do know that the oaks are really good. The oaks only work though, if you've got shrubs or something underneath that lets them keep their leaves around and they don't lose their leaves. I know that when I lived over in Volusia County, I had a, um, a, a really pretty magnolia tree that I got from my, my mother's magnolia tree. It was a baby. And I never trimmed it up to mow under it. I just let it be on the ground and had lots of, of life going on underneath of that, uh, of that tree. And it, it, was, it, was not, it was also nice because I didn't have to worry about stepping on those cones because they just fell underneath the tree. But that magnolia has a lot of things growing under it, but it's a big tree. So you have to be thoughtful. We have to change some of our view of what's going on at the bottom of our trees. We can't have these lollipop trees anymore. We need to make sure that, that the trees go all the way to the bottom. They go to the ground. Lollipop trees are, are not useful. Okay, let's see what's going on. Um, their propagation, who is that? Mike, what's your question? Oh. A list of plants that you want to look at. Um, my, I'm going to send you to the the website for for the Green Isles. Now he's going to have most everything, and if you give me an idea of what kind of yard you have, I will make replacements so that we can pick up all the plants in one point in one in one fell swoop instead of waiting until they get back in stock in June. But let me do this. I think his email address, and you can go to his site and look at what plants he has. And you can tell me, Rena Gardens. Okay, so it's gonna be at AJCP. www.greenisle.gardens. Garden. Oh, it is, yes. Gardens.com. Right. Yeah. Dot com. Um, this is the email address for. If I send, if I put that, uh, I'll just. And, and it's in Groveland. Um, the 10th, the Florida native plants of Marion County are going to have a, a workshop there. I haven't posted it yet because I didn't know until this morning that I was going to be able to do it. I will post that. Uh, you are welcome to join us. Uh, Florida. But let me know if you could come because Mark wanted to know how many people I would be um, 
I would have there. Uh, I thought that it would be helpful to have some of you come at the same time. His garden is set up so that you have a sunny area on near the streets, a shady area in the back, um, a very shady area back in the back. And he has a screen house for some things that are less native. Um, he now has huge properties that go onto the lake that's behind his property. And he is beginning to develop that uh, part of it's for parking because when he has big parties, um, there's a lot of cars, but all the margins are plants that will grow in different habitats. So you can see underneath oaks, as they go into the back, there's uh, getting wetter um, habitat and dry habitat in the middle of the parking lot. So if you open that and go to what plants he has, that'll give you an idea. He has as many native plants pretty much as you can grow at this point. There are about, I think there's, I think there are 4,000 native plants of Florida that can be grown in the nurseries. Now, not all of them grow here. That's all of Florida. Um, I think he keeps about 1,000 to 1,200 different varieties. It could be higher than that, but I think that's about the, a, a reasonable number. The keystones are gonna be the ones that bloom all the time or have a lot of leaves. You want to have plants coming up with growth all through the year so that the, the bumblebee, especially when she comes out in the, in the beginning of the spring, as soon as it gets warm, it could be January, she begins to gain energy so that she can begin to, to in her nest, start to lay the eggs for all of her helpers. And one of those helpers will be another queen, um, but th they pretty much are on an equal, equal footing. And so you need to have things going on early in the year. Um, the fringe tree is really good at the beginning of the year. It is a, my fringe tree is obviously, it's just a baby, but it's, it's a very good, source of, of caterpillar food and grasshopper food. Young grasshoppers can be fed to birds. I don't know if that helps. I'm, I'm gonna be looking at, um, I saw one of the things that Doug continued to go back to was the, the um, Pixter azalea. If you have one of the live oaks or pine trees, the picture azalea will do very well under that along with little blueberries and those don't try to spread out too much they're pretty easy to grow and they don't they don't enlarge quickly there but they'll fill the space does that help anything else uh, the second half of this event is going to happen the 14th um saturday um, what's the time for the Saturday event? Is that 10, 10 a.m.? So that'll be the second half and we'll have all of the plants that I can possibly get there. Um, I'm hoping that if any of you have trucks or large vehicles that you don't mind carrying plants in, that you will join us on the 10th at Green Isle and help me bring them up. Oh, it should be green. You're right. I did spell it wrong. That's what I get for not being on my computer. I'm not a good typist. I apologize. We do it this time. You know, gardens. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thank yeah, you, Elizabeth. There also seems to be a little confusion about what people should send you in the email. Well, I, I'm if you have water, a water or some, I don't know what kind of plants. I can't just get generic plants. Plants, native plants have a right place at the right time. So 
when I'm picking these out and I get a tree and a, um, is it a, a shrub, an annual and a perennial herb for each person, I want it to be able to live. So I need to know, do you have a sandy habitat out there? When you look out in your yard, is it sand and you feel like you need to water it a lot? Well, we can deal with that. There are natives that will be your ground cover. You may not be able to walk on them and play on them as a kid. You're going to have to have a, a little area that you water if you need to have that that kind of habitat. But but the the natives will hold the sand and they you won't have the sand blowing off when the winds come by. Um, you just have to give them a chance. OK, what do we send? Send me your name and your email address. And if you can, if you are in habitat that is dry, if you're at an HMO where you have water every day, that's what I'm going to need. Does that help? Email should say Marion Audubon plants. Oh yeah, if if you'll if you'll give it a subject of Marion Audubon or Marion Audubon plant giveaway, that would help me sort them out. To sort, I don't have a lot of mail in there though. It's not going to be that bad. Refresh. Ah, cool. Okay. Yeah, plants is great. Zoom is good. I, I can live with that. One, two, three, four, five. So I see Gail. I see Suzanne, Valerie, Tammy, Elizabeth. Gail, you did it twice. Oh, and then City of Ocala Re Recreation. Oh, yeah, that's not you. Light Up Ocala is coming up. Okay. <laughs> I get this is my this is my business account. Does that help? No other questions. Are we good? I think so. All right. I'll stop the recording. I think we are completed. I hope I didn't ramble too much. I didn't get a chance to finish typing my question to you. Um, oh, yes. I'm in, I'm in scrub J training on that day that you're doing the follow up of this training. Is there another oh, day? Oh, am that... I supposed to be in scrub J training that day too? Um, you can get a hold of me and I will personally give them to you. I may just go to the scrub J, tr scrub J training after and okay. have to be put up with it. And I'll just bring, um, since you're going to be there, Tammy. Let me yes, know what you want and I will bring them to that training. Um, are, is that the training that's going to be in Marion on the yes. triangle? Yes, okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I know. Okay. I, I know that area. Okay, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you very much for welcome. the presentation today. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I love Doug telling me. I think he's great. I'm writing your note in.